Hi, everyone. Welcome to Science Talk. Uh, my name is Johan, and I'll be your host tonight. Thanks again for joining us on a Tuesday rainy, rainy uh, night in Abbotsford. Um, and I'm just going to start here and Science Talk again. Um, if you haven't been here before, it's um, a place for you to explore the latest ideas in research and science. And uh, what we have in the program tonight is we will have a talk from, a, from an expert. And we've been going through the different research chairs of U of V. And then the second and third series, we've continued um, with uh, scientists from research centers. And I was talking um, with Gary Fair, Dr. Gary Fair, Associate Vice President of U of V, who's going to come and introduce our speaker later uh, tonight. And he was telling me the, of the richness of scientists at U of V, and he believes there's much more uh, science talks uh, in the making. So I'm already looking forward for, for other seasons, but we can uh, focus on this one uh, tonight. And as you know, uh, now, uh, after all this month um, of being on Zoom, um, we will have, uh, you can ask questions in the chat. So uh, during the Q&A, feel free to ask your questions and then I will go through them and bring it to the speakers and we will have a conversation about this. And then the event is uh, being recorded and we'll put it online afterwards. And we have a sort of a communi community agreement at Science Talks where um, we frame this event as a conversation with an expert and it's not a debate, uh, but we do welcome a wide range of questions and we encourage equal participation. We promote a safe environment and we want uh, everyone to be open-minded and bring, uh, bring your, your questions um, and also your generosity in asking questions and trying to understand what is being presented. Um, and we would like to thank our, our partners and sponsor, and I, this would not have been possible uh, without them. And it started with a, a small community grant, the neighborhood grant from, uh, from the Abbotsford Community Foundation. And then we continue with uh, additional sponsor and we'd like to thank the uh, University of the Fraser Valley for the support and also all the, the richness of speakers. Uh, the next, TEDx Abbotsford, the UFV Alumni Association, the Abbotsford Community Foundation, and Vision and, and the city of Abbotsford. So we thanks again, our, thank again our sponsors. And tonight I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Gary Fair. He's the Associate Vice President of the University of the Fraser Valley. And uh, it's an honor to have him with us tonight and he will uh, present the speaker um, for tonight. So welcome, Gary. Thank you, uh, Johan. I much appreciate the opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Anastasia Anderson. Uh, so my area is the uh, area of research engagement and graduate studies. And so even though I'd been at UFE for 14 years and it all overlapped with uh, Dr. Anderson's time at UFE, I never really had much of a chance to get to know her or her work. Uh, so we, my office uh, facilitated the establishment of the UFE Center for Philosophy for Children. And it was that that gave me an opportunity to learn more about Dr. Anderson and her scholarly work. Um, Dr. Anderson's graduate work in philosophy at the University of Toronto focused on ancient Greek philosophy, and in particular, Aristotle's ethics and moral psychology. Uh, she has taught at UFE for over 20 years. She mainly teaches critical thinking, ethics, philosophy of childhood, and ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, Dr. Anderson uh, completed training in philosophy for children at the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children and at the Philosophy Foundation. She has co-authored a textbook in critical thinking called Think It Through, Reasoning in Everyday Life. She's also presented papers at international conferences on philosophy for children, and she's published uh, several journal articles. Most recently, her work is focused on moral education, and she has a chapter in the forthcoming book, Conceptions of Childhood and Moral Education and Philosophy for Children. Now, in most academic introductions, we don't usually mention the following work experience, but in this case, I'm convinced that it's particularly relevant uh, Dr. Anderson has gained valuable experience and insight by raising her own three children. So, Dr. Anderson, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, 
give you this presentation and, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. So I'll just share my screen. What I'm going to do is begin by saying a little bit about what philosophy for children is, and then I'll tell you about the UFB Center for Philosophy for Children. Now, my interest in uh, philosophy for children originates in part from my memories of being curious about philosophical questions when I was a child. I've always known that children pose philosophical questions because I can clearly remember raising those types of questions myself when I was young. Questions like, is my teddy bear really my friend? Is it ever okay to lie? How can we know we're not living in a dream? Will I be the same person when I become an adult? These are philosophical questions, questions about friendship and fairness, reality and knowledge and personal identity. When I was in high school, I often worked with children and I learned that they were able to engage in deep philosophical discussions. So once I started studying philosophy at university, I kept an eye out for information on doing philosophy with children. University philosophy classrooms, however, are definitely not geared towards children. And in fact, when I was a student, children and childhood were subjects that never came up once in any of my classes. But after many years, after having children of my own, after teaching dozens of critical thinking classes to university students, two things became clear to me. First, that we wait too long to give people the opportunity to do philosophy. And that's a shame because philosophical questions are raised when we try to make sense of our world. Philosophical questions are posed when we're trying to understand concepts and experiences that are central to human existence. And second, we wait far too long to really focus on teaching people how to think critically and collaboratively. So fortunately, after I did some digging through the philosophical literature, I found that I wasn't alone in these beliefs. In fact, the philosopher Matthew Lipman had the same thoughts back in the late 1960s. Now, Matthew Lipman was a philosopher who taught at Columbia University in New York, and he was convinced that we should not wait until people are adults to teach them critical thinking skills and logic. And he believed that children could best learn these skills through doing philosophy. He was so convinced that doing philosophy with children would help them to become better thinkers and wiser people that he left his tenured faculty position at Columbia and went to Montclair State University in New Jersey to establish the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children. He developed a pedagogical method and materials that encourage ch uh, children's philosophical curiosity. His aim was to improve children's critical, collaborative, creative and caring thinking. Lippmann's method for doing philosophy for children is the foundation for most other approaches that are used in the world today. And it's the basis of the way we do philosophy with children at the UFE Center for Philosophy for Children. Now the heart of this approach to philosophy for children is the formation of a community of inquiry. Philosophy for children does not teach philosophy in the sense that it teaches children what the famous historical figures in academic philosophy believed. Also, the teacher does not direct children towards particular answers to philosophical questions or try to teach children to hold a particular philosophical point of view. Instead of being passive learners, children do philosophy. And through doing philosophy, they learn thinking skills that can be applied in other areas of learning and in their lives. Children work together to answer questions in dialogue with each other. The role of the teacher is to be a facilitator of the inquiry dialogue and not someone who's going to give children all the answers. The children are given space to work through their own answers with a facilitator who asks questions to highlight their reasoning moves. So typically a philosophy for children session begins either with a story or an activity that has some philosophically rich concepts and issues at play. 
Next, the teacher, who's usually called the facilitator, either poses a philosophical question or asks children to come up with their own questions. When the children are asked to develop their own questions, then there's usually a discussion of how questions might be related, and then the children vote to decide which question they're going to discuss. After this, the children work together to think through answers to the questions by engaging in the facilitated dialogue. So this facilitated inquiry dialogue gives children a chance to reflect on philosophical questions and gives them practice in a range of important thinking skills. So I've got them listed there and I, I really think it's worth just reading this list because it's so important. During the dialogue, the children are encouraged to offer a hypothesis and answer to the question. And you, you almost always get hypotheses. There's, there's rarely only one hypothesis. The children give reasons for their positions. They listen respectfully, recognize differences in views, carefully consider opposing points of view, consider objections, provide examples and counterexamples to help establish or disprove claims identify and address underlying assumptions, consider approaches that haven't been taken yet, build on what other people have said, and consider whether or not they should change their minds. The role of the facilitator depends somewhat on the age of the children and how experienced they are with philosophical inquiry dialogue. The facilitator generally encourages the children to give reasons listen and respond to each other. In particular, the children are encouraged to be open to changing their minds if they hear better reasons for a different position. The facilitator will ask follow-up questions, highlight the reasoning that's being used, sometimes remind children of what others have said, and anchor the discussion in the initial inquiry question while opening up related questions one of the ways to open up thinking is by asking questions that lead to opposing answers from the group. As soon as you have more than one answer, the group works together to figure out which answer has the best reasons to support it. It's very important to recognize that what happens in a community of inquiry dialogue is more than just a discussion. It isn't simply an exchange of ideas. The children work together to support their claims and build on each other's arguments in ways that are respectful and open to difference. It's the open-ended nature of philosophical questions that make them such good fodder for dialogue and education and thinking. The goal of the dialogue is not to reach consensus and it's not to come up with the ultimate correct answer to the questions. The goal of the dialogue is to reach a deeper understanding of different answers and the reasons that can be given for them. Philosophical dialogue involves analyzing and refining concepts, recognizing the need for and then constructing definitions and determining how to distinguish between good reasons and bad reasons. All of these are essential skills in critical thinking. Usually the inquiry dialogue is centered on a concrete question about something that's happened in context. So usually the context of a story. Answering the question requires identifying and developing uh, an understanding of a central concept, for example, friendship or freedom. You might, for example, tell the story of a child who gets a robot as a present and then raise the question of whether or not that robot is, a child, is the child's friend. And then the children offer answers and give their reasons and usually use examples from their own experience to defend or reject different hypotheses. In this case, they would also be working towards an understanding of the concept of friendship. So um, I have a few snippets of a community of inquiry dialogue, um, two different excuse me, two different dialogues that I'm going to show you just to give you an idea of how uh, a segment at least of such sessions might uh, run. Uh, we don't normally videotape dialogues, um, but this summer we had a few short videos taken and I put together a little comp compilation. It's only about three minutes long, just to give the audience a sense of what it looks like to do philosophy for children. 
Um, the children in this group are age five to nine, um, mostly between six and eight. And at least three of these children only started grade one this fall. So it's a small group and with a wide age range because of some of the COVID restrictions we had to work with. Also, I'll let you know, they weren't required to wear masks, but some of them wanted to sort of on and off. And what I want to illustrate with the video is really the collaborative nature of philosophy for children and the dialogues that uh, arise. And I want you to pay attention to the use of examples and counter examples as they work together to pin down concepts. So the first a little bit of dialogue here was somewhat spontaneous. You can see we're sitting on the floor. The topic for the day was generosity. And I remembered a lesson plan that I learned at the Philosophy Foundation in England um, that explores what we mean by ownership and how we know something belongs to us. And the second dialogue uh, was in response to a story and the children were trying to reach a deeper understanding of that concept of generosity. Heather, who do you think the boat belongs to? It belongs to me. Why does it belong to me? Because it belongs to you. Because it what? Because you made it. Because I made it. Oh, so then is that how you know that something belongs to someone? If you make it, then it belongs to you? Yeah. Well, if you make something and then you give it to someone, like as a gift, then it belongs to them. Okay, so now we have two um, ways or, that something can belong to you. Um, or if you buy it um, at a store, it comes. One of them buys it on the lake, and then the other one. Oh, so they could take turns. And they could decide, okay, first it's your turn, and then it's your turn, and that way, who does it belong to then if they take turns? Both of them. As long as you want to use something, then it's partly yours. No, no. No? no? If you want to use a playground, it's not yours. Oh. Okay. So then, is it going to be Penny's if Penny comes along and wants to use it too? No. No? Okay. What do you think is really yucky? Tomatoes. What is? Tomatoes. Oh, me too. me too. I don't like tomatoes. I hate tomatoes. I am going to give all my tomatoes to Cambria and all of my tomatoes to Evan. Okay, you're not leaving my tomatoes. Why not? I don't want stuff that you want. Tomatoes. A generous gift if you give more stuff that you do want. Almost. Like, if, if, she, if you don't like them, actually, if she knows that she really, you know that she really wants one truly bad, then mm -hmm. you can give it and you be nice and generous. So that's a little different from what Camber said earlier. She said that you are generous when you give something that you really want. So Camber, do you still think the same or are you going to change your mind? I, I still think the same. That you are being the most generous when you give away something that you want, you think is important. Well, the only thing is, like, they might not like the same things as you. So if it's someone's birthday and you get them something that you like, it might, it, and you know that they, like, might not like it, but you like it and you go and give it to them, it's not really being generous because you know they don't like it. Mm. What do you think about that, Cambria? I think, I, I would agree with Abby. But like, if you guys both want the same thing, it'd be generous if she gave away something that you wanted. So there are many goals and many benefits of doing philosophy for children. And I thought I would outline some of the key goals for you. Um, one goal of philosophy for children is, as I've said, to help children improve their thinking skills. Lippmann maintained that children develop thinking skills in the community of inquiry and then those skills get internalized in each individual child. What this means is that when a child is thinking on their own about what should be done or what they should believe, they'll be familiar with considering reasons because this is what happens in the community of inquiry dialogue. 
the practice in reasoning that they have had with others becomes part of how they think on their own. It will help them to stop and think carefully before deciding what to do or believe. They'll ask themselves, do I have good reasons? What might be another way of looking at it? So certainly one of the goals of doing philosophy for children is to help children develop their thinking skills. And while empirical research into the benefits of philosophy for children is not my area of expertise, I'm, I'm not a social scientist, my area is the humanities, there's a lot of empirical research that's being done to confirm the effectiveness of philosophy for children as a method for improving children's thinking skills. Philosophy for children has been shown to improve children's cognitive skills as measured by standardized tests, such as the Cognitive Abilities Test, New Jersey Thinking Skills Tests and IQ scores, as well as by pre and post program questionnaires, reports from observers, teachers and self reports from students. Other studies have found that after children attend philosophy for children programs in schools, Participation in class discussion increases and children were twice as likely to support their views with reasons. But one of the things that philosophy for children also does is strengthen children's cooperative reasoning. Researchers have found evidence of improved social skills um, and children's willingness to ask each other's question, ask each other questions and engage with each other. In schools where teachers use philosophy for children as part of their practice, there's evidence also of improved school culture and climate. Large studies in the UK have also found that philosophy for children programs result in gains in math and reading test scores. And this is particularly true for disadvantaged children who appear to benefit the most from the programs. Studies have also found evidence of improved self-esteem and self-confidence um, resulting from philosophy for children programs. There's been a lot of empirical research and as more academic researchers become interested in philosophy for children, um, I think that the research will get more plentiful and more varied as well. Certainly helping children to improve their thinking skills is one of the main goals of philosophy for children as we think of it as the UFB Center. Um, however, there are a number of other benefits to doing philosophy for children that are also understood as goals. Some philosophy for children practitioners take a child rights approach in setting out goals for philosophy for children. The community of philosophical inquiry, as well as being an educational approach that teaches children how to communicate and reason well, also gives children opportunities to have their questions and voices heard, and is one way of honoring children's participation rights. Some theorists have argued that there should be a community of inquiry approach used to include children's voices in making decisions about school structure, events, and curriculum. Another common goal of those who practice philosophy for children is related to democracy. Lipman, for example, wrote that philosophy for children helps to foster democratic citizenship. Democracies need citizens who are reasonable and able to productively engage with each other across difference. Citizens need to problem solve and work together. These are exactly the skills that philosophy for children helps children to develop. Furthermore, liberal democracies like Canada are founded on philosophical concepts like freedom and equality. Philosophy for children gives children practice in concept formation and analysis relevant to understanding and applying those sorts of political concepts. The centers worked um, very closely with the Vancouver Institute of Philosophy for Children, and one of their stated goals is to help children build autonomy through helping them improve their thinking skills. By teaching children to stop and think carefully about their reasons before doing something or believing something, you help children gain more control over their lives and choices. Children who are used, uh, who are used to considering reasons are less likely to be taken in by propaganda, the poor reasoning of others, and are less likely to go with the flow and do something just because it's popular. The thinking skills that children gain from doing philosophy can help them recognize the influences that stop them from making well-reasoned choices. 
And then the last bullet point there is philosophical reflection. Because there are many benefits of philosophy for children related to thinking skills and academic skills, sometimes this goal and benefit can get left out. But to me, it's a very important one. Philosophy for children gives children the opportunity to reflect on philosophical concepts and to actually do philosophy. Children are given space to talk about big ideas and big questions with other children. And I believe personally that this is a valuable human endeavor in and of itself. So now I've said a little bit about what philosophy for children is, um, I'd like to tell you a bit about the UFV Center for Philosophy for Children. The UFV Center is only a few months old, but it is taking up the reins of work that was previously done through the philosophy department. And we have plans to expand from primarily community engagement work to offering more support for research. The center is currently working with the Vancouver Institute of Philosophy for Children to offer the Thinking Playground summer camps. The summer camps started in 2014 and run for two weeks each summer. They're for six to 13 year olds and are based in our philosophy for children approach. The camp has received glowing reviews from parents and from campers, and they also give our UFB students opportunities to learn about philosophy for children and work with children from the community. We've also recently developed a course on teaching children philosophy, and it's going to be offered in winter of 2022. As part of that course, UFB students will be facilitating sessions for children in Abbotsford. Another way that we've been working with the community is through promoting and supporting the regional and national Canadian High School Ethics Bowl. Um, these are competitions that are run for public high school students across Canada. Students are asked to address ethical case studies, for example, cases related to the ethics of deep sea mining, fast fashion, climate change, and they engage with teams from other schools. They're scored on their understanding of the ethical issues, their ability to present their reasons, their ability to respond to each other's reasons, and their respectful attitude. It has some of the format of a debate, but it's much more collaborative, and the two competing teams can take the same side of an issue rather than having to always take opposing sides. The Center is also working on developing workshops for teachers who are interested in philosophy for children and how it might be used in their classrooms. Over this, the first year of its existence, the Center plans to focus on supporting research not only in philosophy for children, but in related areas as well. So far, we've had uh, students and faculty and alumni give presentations at international conferences on philosophy for children and publish articles and book chapters. But one of the things that we'll be doing at the center is supporting and promoting research in related areas as well. Given the range of goals and benefits of philosophy for children, there are intersections between what we do in philosophy and many other disciplines, work on children's rights, and particularly participatory rights is deeply relevant to philosophy for children. Issues of child development and political status are also related to our work. And we're hoping to forge connections with people who are interested in math and science education to see where the community of inquiry of method can help boost children's mathematical and scientific reasoning. Philosophy for Children has been endorsed by UNESCO, and in fact, UNESCO funds a chair in Philosophy for Children um, at the University of Nantes in France. Philosophy for Children is now done in over 60 countries, and practitioners have often developed materials that are geared specifically for their own contexts. Now, although Philosophy for Children has been done in Quebec for many years, it has only recently begun to gain traction in the rest of Canada. UFV, in fact, has been one of the few Canadian universities to support Philosophy for Children programming in the community. I believe it's time to have conversations about Canadian approaches to Philosophy for Children. And these conversations must involve Indigenous people. So the Centre has started planning a speaker series to discuss what it might mean to Indigenize philosophy for children and how best to amplify the voices of Indigenous children. So if you're interested in more information about the Centre, you can visit our website or if you have any questions for me directly, I've got my email 
address right there. It's p4c at ufb.ca. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. This was this was fascinating, and uh, thank you for for sharing your work uh, tonight. And uh, as a reminder, you can uh, ask question in the chat. I've seen there's already some questions uh, coming up, and I think people are quite enthusiastic to hear uh, about your work. I'd like to start with one one question that kind of surprised me in a way when you mentioned the the goals of of, of the work, um, and I think there will valuable goals, but I was surprised not to see uh, empathy as a kind of a core core goal to create um, empathy by using dialogue so that you can understand the other person you're talking to and empathy in the sense of just an easy definition of uh, sharing the ability to understand uh, what the other person feels. Um, so uh, could you comment on this? Yes, um, thank you for that question. I, I do feel as though empathy could be added to those lists of goals. And certainly right from the beginning, um, the idea of thinking skills uh, was not just meant to encompass critical thinking. So caring thinking has always been one of the skills that has been included in those that are supposed to be developed by philosophy for children. So there's a, a big emphasis on caring thinking. And uh, although it's not usually referred to as empathy, I think it captures basically the same idea. When the children are able to speak to each other and to hear each other's reasons and to listen carefully and respectfully to each other, um, then this promotes a caring environment. And that caring, I think, carries through to other aspects of their lives. And I think too, like if you're able to, I remember in a logic class I took a long time ago about the ability to, when you have an argument you disagree with, to be generous with this argument and even make it better, improve the argument that you're, you're initially against, but to really trying to understand before actually uh, giving an answer. And I think one of the points that you mentioned, and I thought that was very good, it's all those, um, to the way you frame um, this sort of this dialogue. And I was like, you want uh, people to give reasons for their position, listen respectfully, recognize difference in views, consider objection. I thought this was fascinating and it's so important. And as you mentioned for democracy, and I was like, oh man, this should be a course for politicians. <laughs> um, and you did mention this, that it will, because our democracy, liberal democracies are based on this ability to reason and to give arguments. But it seems that now that the way we live in is so far removed from that type of conversation. Um, so I was wondering too, like even this framing would be good for social media, right? Before jumping into someone's comments to like truly trying to understand the comment. So I was wondering, don't you think these courses should be philosophy for teenagers, philosophy for young adults, philosophy for everyone? Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I think it's, it's um, the need for philosophy is becoming more and more evident all the time. I sometimes look at comments online and I think that the, you know, the six-year-olds that I work with could do a better job of responding to each other than the people on social media. And it's something that we really do foster. It's, it's an ability to communicate across differences. And we try, to, we try to promote the idea that someone who disagrees with you is not your enemy. In fact, in some ways, that person is your best friend because they're helping you think about your reasons more carefully. They're helping you look through different lenses, take different perspectives. And yes, I think our politicians probably could stand doing some philosophy for children. Um, I think it would be wonderful if these programs could make it into schools all throughout Canada. Um, and are you familiar? I think your work is, uh, it reminds me of the work from uh, David Baum on dialogue. I, I don't know if you're familiar with his writing. No. Um, so it's a, I think he was a, a physicist before he wrote on the on dialogue and he, he believed that, stu, that dialogue was a way 
um, to go beyond the impasse of conflict and argument to have a true, a true of a dialogue. But I wonder um, then, because you talked about indigenizing, no, indigenizing. Philosophy, yeah, philosophy. Um, I wonder what that means because it seems to me that your approach is very, uh, and I think it's in one of the comments. There's a, a Western kind of a European feel about dialogue. It even reminds me of kind of the Socratic dialogue. Uh, of uh, a way of knowing and understanding and delivering something. So I was wondering if um, in indigenous philosophy, how will it combine uh, with what you're, what you're um, presenting? Well, of course, a, a good reason to have a speaker's series or a workshop or a conference on a topic is because you're interested in finding out the answer you want to know. And so, I mean, this is one of the things that we're planning to do is to, to try to have this discussion of what it might mean to indigenize philosophy for children. And philosophy for children is being done in indigenous communities in various parts of the world. I know in Mexico, in parts of South America, um, I recently saw a presentation from someone who works with Sami children. And so I think it would be a wonderful thing to get practitioners together um, with Indigenous educators um, and Indigenous children too and find out what that might look like. One of the things about philosophy though is that it opens up questions and so and, and this is particularly true within a community of inquiry. So it may seem as though it's a very western approach to thinking and dialogue but that is always open to question that is never put forward as the only way to approach reasoning. Thank you. And uh, I, I see we have also like a few comments that, that came in. So I will, uh, I'm just gonna jump in and, and read some of them. And, and if there's some that uh, can be combined, I will do as well. So uh, first question from Bob Strain who asks, suppose a child in your group is timid and doesn't want to join in by expressing their opinion because they say they don't want to have an opinion or something. Could you give an example of how would you address this child? Mm -hmm. um, well, that sometimes happens and, and no one in the community is ever required to talk. Um, but there are a number of different strategies that we use and certainly one is simply to ask um, if we can hear from the silent voices. And so as a facilitator, you really try to make sure you're paying attention to who's speaking and who isn't and give children the opportunities to speak in case they want to. Um, sometimes children don't want to participate. Uh, and sometimes it's because they're shy and sometimes it's because they're they're not sure what they want to say exactly. And so you'll have a child who, you know, you'll say, what, is, what do you think about this? And, and the child might say, um, I don't know. And then a, a very often a good follow-up is, well, what, what's, why don't you know? What is it that is confusing you? And then you'll sometimes open up a whole explanation that will be very fruitful for the dialogue. Um, but sometimes it's just a matter of getting comfortable children aren't always used to um, being given the space to voice their opinions and talk about their views. But there are other ways that we um, can get those silent voices heard in philosophy for children. Very often we'll do follow-up um, with art activities or writing activities so that even if a child isn't feeling comfortable working in the community dialogue at that moment, they still have a way of expressing themselves and their, their point of view. Thanks. Is, is it, would it be even possible to, uh, maybe they're a bit too young, to write down the questions? Um, sometimes it depends on the age range, um, but uh, sometimes they'll write down questions. Some facilitators will ask students to write down answers to the question before the dialogue and then again after the dialogue. There are a lot of different approaches. Um, and then the next question from uh, Dr. John McLean, UFV president. Hi again pleasure to have you with us uh, tonight. And I think, yes, um, she, I think she's never missed one of those science talks, so congrats to her. And I think Gary uh, Fair as well, who mentioned, uh, mentioned to me before the, we started that he went to all of them. So it's very exciting. 
Um, thank you. And the question is, uh, thank you for the very informative presentation. I really like the concept of children doing philosophy in a collaborative way. Is five-year-old the youngest age of children you might work with? Is this type of program used in K-12 classrooms? Um, yes, it is uh, used K-12. to um, I did a little bit of work in a kindergarten uh, class in Chilliwack, and it's very common to start uh, philosophy for children at the kindergarten uh, age, but there are also some practitioners who work with even younger children. So nursery school, pre-K, also, um, of course, you have to facilitate a little bit differently. And you might have noticed that in the first section of the video, too, I was allowing children to kind of wander out of the circle and back in again, because I think that's actually an important thing when you're working with really small children in that kind of context. But yeah, there are children who will do philosophy with three and four year olds as well. And, and uh, if you yeah, no, that's, that's, and, and if you're a parent and you want to kind of implement some of those philosophical inquiry and um, um, I think you mentioned about a community of inquiry and some of those early life skills, I would say, how could you, how could you start? Like, would you have uh, any resources? Because I think we can send them to, um, to some of your program, but how, what can you do at home? Um, well, there are a lot of resources available online and at our website, um, the center website, we do have some links that might be useful. But what's really amazing is how you can find philosophical content in so many different things that you do as a parent, the, so many books that you read to your children, movies that they might watch. And then um, to my mind, the trick is to allow your children to ask these philosophical questions and not feel like you have to answer them, but instead engage them in a conversation, in a dialogue where you allow them the space to explore their own thinking about the philosophy. So that I think that would be my advice. That's a, kind of a hard thing for parents to do sometimes. I think that parents like to feel as though they can give their children all the answers. Um, but in this case, it, I think it is really valuable to give them the opportunity to talk things through. And you'll be amazed with what they say. You really will. Yeah, I'm looking forward to testing with my three-year-old. Yeah. The earlier the better. And then connected with, uh, still connecting with, uh, with um, questions about um, children and kids here, there's a question from Mary O'Connell, who says, many of the schools in Abbotsford have a strong affiliation to religious school. How do you see the philosophy principle being adopted without bias in these faith-based faith schools? Yeah. Um, interestingly, um, I did some training in England um, with an organization called the Philosophy Foundation. And a lot of the work that they do is in schools with religious affiliations. Um, and what it really requires is a certain amount of openness from the facilitator. So what you're doing in the community of inquiry is allowing children to raise questions and reason through their own answers. Um, this is completely, I think, doable in the religious school context because people who are uh, involved in organizing and running religious schools are also concerned that children learn to reason well and that they can defend their beliefs with good, well-reasoned um, considerations. And I guess that would, that would create this community of, of inquiry and, and then that, that would be, as you say, uh, probably helpful to, to a religious group. And, and then maybe here, like, I mean, a lot of religion have also like philosophical assumptions um, that can be probably analyzed and, and looked into. Um, and then uh, other questions here from Robert Martins, who says, delightful stuff. Uh, indeed, it was delightful stuff. And I think adults would benefit too. And I think, I think we've agreed on this, that uh, it should go beyond uh, just children. Now you say you're not imparting any philosophical position to the children, but are we not imparting a Western European point of view 
uh, which is a bias in itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I mentioned this before. Um, this is something that people who do philosophy for children um, engage in discussion about quite a bit. And the, I think that what the practitioners try to do is to ensure that there is enough openness and diversity amongst the community that you're not guiding the conversation in only one direction. And that openness to questioning, um, even the nature of the dialogue itself, I think is part of what can liberate us from a solely Western European understanding of philosophy and inquiry. Yeah, I think it connects with uh, our science talk last month with uh, Dr. Vinana Hall from the Indigenous Studies, who emphasized a lot on the importance of stories and stories, there's dialogue in stories. So I think there is there a way to, uh, to not be Western or European focus. There's probably a lot of stories and other dialogue that happens outside of this, the Western canon of philosophy. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. You have to make sure that the, the content of the stories um, is diverse, but you also have to make sure that the dialogue is open enough to di diversity. Yeah, it's gotta be both. Yes. And then another question uh, here from Hannah Cook. Fantastic presentation. Those are the keyword I found tonight. Delightful, fantastic. This is great. Fantastic presentation. How do you see the principle of, the, of community of inquiry and philosophy for children informing university teaching? And what might that look like? Yeah, um, I think that it, it really can inform university teaching. I think that it changes the position of power that the teacher generally has that can sometimes um, be work wonderfully well, but at other times can squelch um, discussion and dialogue and creativity amongst your students. So I think it's a wonderful method that is completely applicable in the university classroom situation. And I mean, I've used it in the past and my university students have been absolutely delighted. Um, and they, they understand the material in a different kind of way. I, I've used it um, largely in critical thinking classes where suddenly they're seeing themselves using the, um, the textbook material in a different way and in a way that's really important to them and that they can relate more clearly to their own lives. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's the, the transfer is, is clear. So I think you could do a philosophy for politicians. I'm, I'm enjoying the thought of this idea along a community of inquiry line. Yeah, so, so connected here with, uh, you say philosophy for politician, but if we take politician in the sense of the polis of finding a way to live together and agreeing on this, on um, ways to live in an empathic, empathic world, a world mm -hmm. with more empathy. Mm -hmm. My question, and I think that would be the, the final question we, before we close, in an ideal world, like what is your dream for, philosophy for children or, or the principle of philosophy for children in an ideal world, how would they impact our community? And by our community, I mean being very practical, let's say Abbotsford and, the, and Fraser Valley. How could it impact our community? Yeah. Or how I could see it being implemented within the community? Yeah, and, and the, the, those principles, we said, we, we did mention like, oh, it would be good that those principles should be applied in social media. Politicians should probably use it, maybe not just for children. So how would, how can we like make this happen? Yeah, uh, well, I think the way we make it happen is by having more philosophy for children, programming things like summer camps, but also bringing it into schools on a whole school kind of basis. I think that that's a way um, that it really can, uh, have an impact on the community as a whole. And there are schools where 100% of the teachers, school, I was just reading about one in Hawaii, an elementary school in Hawaii, where all of their teachers incorporate philosophy for children into their practice, into their teaching practice. And 
that this was one of the examples where philosophy for children has really changed the school climate, the school culture. And I think that that's what we need. There have been um, anecdotal reports from principals. They've also got schools in Australia where the entire school uses a philosophy for children approach, a community inquiry uh, approach to teaching. And um, anecdotal reports have, have said that um, this has reduced bullying in schools. It's reduced schoolyard violence. And so it's, it's the reasoning, I think, that's supported by philosophy, but also the social interactions and the caring behavior. And if there's a way of bringing it to schools in Abbotsford, I think it can have a powerful, powerful impact on society. And uh, I, I mentioned this was gonna be the last question, but another question came here, so I would, I would read it here from uh, Bob Strain, who mentions, I think I know which topics I would like to introduce to a group of preteens, but could you give example of taboo conversation items for this age group? For preteens? Yeah, I think that's what it's mentioned. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you, first of all, that um, philosophy for children, um, we don't usually think of topics as being taboo. Uh, we do try to work with age appropriate topics, but because often we'll allow children to bring up their own questions and um, generate the dialogue based on their questions, we don't try to control the questions that children ask us. Um, so I think that what you can do, and again, you can go to our webpage and find a whole list of different resources available, is to look through some of those resources, see what kinds of stimulus material are used, and then allow the children to ask their own questions about what they found philosophically interesting in the material. Thank you. And. Um... Yeah, I think for in, in closing here, I think that, that one of the key words that come, come to my mind is this, this idea of community of inquiry and creating this. So with children, with preteen, with teenager, with adults. And then the opposite for me that comes to mind is now the, the key words online is like, oh, I've done my own research, therefore, da, da, da. and you're like, oh man, was that your own research or was just confirmation of preconceived bias? But so I think that that notion of community of, of inquiry and this principle are, are key for our democracy. And I think for, as you mentioned, to create uh, uh, children and future citizen uh, that will be guided with uh, empathy. So I think it's very important. So I would like to thank you again for, for this uh, delightful uh, presentation and evening. And I will now uh, just uh, remind everyone um, can you see the screen here? Yes, I believe so. Let me just check it again here. Yes. Um, yes, so thanks for, for this evening. And uh, next month, we will have uh, Edward Akufo from the Center for Global Development, and then uh, Ar Arvind Cohen from the Center for Public Safety and Criminal Justice. So we're looking forward for, these, for this uh, science talk as well. And you can you can register on our website um, and you can tell your friends about it too, to come and join us. We are on different social media, so you can also promote it. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, the University of the Fraser Valley, uh, Connects, TEDx Abbotsford, the UFV Alumni Association and Vision uh, and the Abbotsford Community Foundation for all of their support to make this happen. And I'm actually looking forward to have uh, more in the future. And here are, as I mentioned, our social media. And if you uh, feel the, the desire or the wish to contribute so we can keep uh, going with uh, this program, we have the donate page on science talks that's we donate and we use the, it's run by a not non-for-profit and the funds are used to continue the, the program. So I would like to thank everyone again and we'll see you uh, next month. Thank you.